I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We've been talking about widows. It says, honor widows that are widows indeed in verse 3. We made it all the way down to verse 9, so I'll just start down there in verse 9. It says, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old. So if a widow is under three score years old, that is 60 years old, then don't take her into the number. That is, don't take her on the roll to be supported financially by the church. So let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old. And then it says, having been the wife of one man. So she must be obviously single now. And before she could only have been married to one man. That's a pretty big requirement. And you can compare that back with First Timothy 3 and verse 2, where it talks about the pastor. And it says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Notice it doesn't uh, say must have been the husband of one wife. So you see, must be the husband of one wife, meaning presently, he must be the husband of one wife, meaning he can't have more than one wife at a time. It's polygamy there. Now here, for the widow, it's having been the wife of one man. So that's, that's different there. So she must have she must be single now and she could only have been the wife of one man. And then it says well reported of for good works. And you look at again the qualifications for a pastor back in 3 and verse 7 it says moreover he must have a good report of them which are without. He must have a good report among people, especially those that are without lost people. And then the widow must be well reported of for good works. So you see, uh, most of these the qualifications for a pastor, it's not just saying, you know, do this good if you want to be a pastor. You need to do good works whether you're a pastor or not. Because even the widow, she's supposed to do good works. So well reported of for good works, and here's some good works. If she have brought up children, that's a big thing. I don't know if you have children, but if you have children, it's a hard thing to bring up children. If you have successfully brought up children from birth to the time they're out of your house, that's a big accomplishment. That's a good work. Well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, trained them up in the way they should go. If she have lodged strangers. So she's hospitable. You can compare that with the qualifications for a pastor back here. Where it says in chapter 3 and verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. See, it's not just a pastor that needs to have those requirements. Even a widow needs those requirements. So we need to all try to meet those requirements. She lodged strangers. She's given the hospitality. Now, I know we don't do that too much nowadays in our culture here. But they definitely did then. Lodge strangers. If she have washed the saints' feet. Now obviously we don't do that much in this culture here. But nonetheless, this is a good work. She's washed the saints' feet. And notice this is more like a home thing. This isn't something that's done with, with the church or anything like that. So it's not like it's an ordinance or nothing. It's just, you know, she's lodged, lodged strangers, and those strangers come in, and she's washed the saints' feet. Let me give you an example of a good woman, somebody that's lodged strangers. You look at Acts 16, 14. It says, And a certain woman named Lydia, 
a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So this Lydia, that's someone, an example of someone who lodged strangers, was good to the saints. And then it says in 1 Timothy 5.10, Wash the saints' feet if she have relieved the afflicted. You think about somebody that relieves the afflicted, most likely they've gone through afflictions and they know how it feels. Many times the Lord lets you go through affliction so you know how it feels and you'll end up being more likely to relieve the afflicted. So relieve the afflicted. She cares about other people. And what goes around comes around. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. She spent a lot of time relieving the afflicted. Now in her affliction, the church can help relieve her. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Now you look back at 1 Timothy 2.10. And it says, talking about uh, in verse 9 there, 1 Timothy 2, 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but, what, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So, becometh women professing godliness. Something that would, you need to live and your life should match a woman that professes godliness with good works. So she's diligently followed every good work. She's well reported of for good works. It's known that she's a good woman. It's known that she does these good works. This is a requirement for, to be a widow that's taken in the number. So it says in 1 Timothy 5.11, But, now here is the widows that you don't take into the number, that you don't take on the roll to be supported. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. You see, a younger widow, her husband died early in life. She's not, she's not ready to settle down. She's going to be tempted to, to, not, to not keep this pledge to stay single here and she's going to want to get married and here if she's going to be supported by the church but then she's going to end up wanting to get married again and it says to wax wanton against Christ the younger's widows refuse when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ they will marry you know she's going to need a husband so there's really no need to take her on because then her husband, her new husband, would be able to support her. And there's no need in uh, her even being took on in the first place. Because obviously she's going to want to get married again. And that's perfectly fine because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, But if they cannot contain, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn. It's better to marry than to uh, burn in your lust. And he says, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, you know, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. In 1 Corinthians 7, 2, it says that. So uh, the younger widows refuse. Most likely they're going to burn in their lust. They're going to struggle with their lust. And they're going to end up wanting to get married again. They're going to wax wanting against Christ. And they will marry. Verse 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. So you see, if they uh, tell the church they're wanting to be supported, they're a widow, and, you know, if, if the church takes you on, then you're saying, well, I'm, I'm a widow and I'm staying single. But then you go back on that and you get married, you're casting off your, your first faith. 
of trusting in Christ to take care of you. And she has damnation. And that's not eternal damnation in hell. That's temporal damnation. Just like in many other verses, it, it the way it uses the word damnation doesn't mean uh, eternal damnation in hell. For example, 1 Corinthians 11, 29 talking about taking the Lord's Supper. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh to himself damnation, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Then you look at the next, next verse, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So the damnation was not eternal damnation. It wasn't eternal death. It was a, a damnation where somebody could get physically sick or die physically not spiritually or you think about romans 8 1 you think well this uh, uh does this widow she's having damnation that means she's going to hell no it doesn't mean she's going to hell because uh she would be sa she's saved and it says in romans 8 1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit or you think about romans 14 23 in Romans 14 23 it says and he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin now obviously he's not going to hell because he ate something without faith it's a fellowship thing it's a, a thing where you're bringing damnation to your flesh. You're uh, bringing damnation to your fellowship. Things like that. It doesn't have to do with your salvation. So the younger widows refuse because... Don't even take her into the number. Refuse them. Because she's still young. She's going to wax wanting against Christ. She's going definitely going to have a lust problem. She's going to want to get married again. And if she's took on into the number... You know, she's going to cast off her first faith. She's going to take back on this pledge that she has. And she's going to wax wanting against Christ. So don't even fool with taking her into the number. And look what uh, trouble sh she's going to get into if you take her into the number. Supporting her uh, as a younger widow. This is the consequences that usually it's going to lead to. Because since she's in support by you. Uh, she's very unbusy. And it says in verse 13, And with all they learn to be idle. Now she doesn't have anything to do. And being idle, never a good thing, according to the Bible. You know, the sin of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. And she learns to be idle, wandering about from house to house. She's going to have time to go about from house to house, and maybe even mess up other people's marriages. Uh, I've found uh, by experience but uh, in my own life and seeing other people's lives around me that uh, a lot of marriage troubles can be caused by a woman who is bored and wants to call another woman on the phone and insert herself in that person's life and give them advice on their marriage and things like that. And it leads to a lot of fights. So she's wandering about from house to house you know, causing trouble, being a gossip, being a tellbearer. And, you know, where no terror tellbearer is, the strife seizeth. So she's wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies. So she's got a mouth problem. She's going to just have so much energy to run her mouth because she's not doing anything else. Uh, speaking things which they ought not. You know, you do, uh, all you got all these people going around saying, I, well, I'll just say what's on my mind. Well, there's some things that you should not speak. You don't have to tell everybody everything that you know. But the a younger widow who's taken in the number, she's going to end up in this type of trouble. It's so, so Paul gives the solution. He says, I will therefore that the younger women marry. He wants them to go ahead and get married. It's better to marry than to burn. Nevertheless, let every, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. 
I will, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear, bear children, go ahead and have more children because they keep you busy. If you've got children, you know, you don't really have any idle time when you have children. Bear children, guide the house. So she, if she bears children, gets married, she's, you know, a, a, a married woman is busy caring for the things of her husband. According to 1 Corinthians 7, if she bears children, that's going to take up even more time. She's not going to have time to be idle. And then if she guides the house, well, there goes the rest of your time. That's a full-time job, taking care of a husband and children and guiding a house. That's a lot of work. And you're not going to have time to be idle. Just like men, a, a man, uh, he, most men, they need to get married, they need to bear children, and they need to go to work. And then you're not going to have time to be idle and get into trouble. And then give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. The adversary, the devil, and people like the devil. Don't give them an occasion to blaspheme. Don't give them an occasion to speak things about you because you know who the devil is? He's the accuser of the brethren. And uh, people just go around uh, trying to look at you, pick holes in your life. They'll do anything to pull up dirt. Maybe even go on your Facebook, look at pictures of you 15 years ago that you forgot that you put on there before you were saved. Maybe you were flipping somebody off in the picture. And then they'll pull that back up on you. Or just anything. They, they want to uh, nitpick you. And try to find some uncleanness in you. So you, if and, but if you are married, have children, God in the house, you're not going to have time to get into trouble. You're not going to have time to give occasion to do, to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And it says in verse 15, for some are already turned aside after Satan. You see, some some of those younger widows maybe that they take on. They've already turned aside after Satan. They're already out there not living for God. They're out there waxing, wanting against Christ. So they're not qualified to be took on as a widow, not to be taken in the number. So it says in verse 16, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So, uh, if the widows have a believer who can help, then let them, so the church doesn't have to be charged, and the church can have uh, more opportunity to really relieve the ones that are widows indeed. The ones that are meeting all these qualifications. The three score years old widows. Widows that had been the wife of one man, well reported up for good works, lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, and so on and so forth. If, if, uh, if you just keep taking on every widow that came your way, you wouldn't even have opportunity to take on the widows that really needed you. <clears throat> then it says in verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So the elders that rule well. Once again, that I'll take you back to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, uh, where it says, talking about a pastor, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So somebody like that, an elder that rules well, he should be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. You know, it's labor to be in the Bible and to, to get up every day and to get in the Bible. It makes you tired, and you, you can see that plainly because nobody wants to do it. Nobody really gives the time to the word and doctrine at all. And Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 says, Much study is a weariness to the flesh. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's work. You're a workman if you rightly divide the word of truth. 
if somebody knows how to rightly divide, that shows they've put the time in, that shows they've labored in the word and doctrine. And if you have an elder that rules well, if you have a pastor that rules well, he should be uh, worthy of double honor. Just like uh, we're uh, having Pastor Appreciation Day at where I go to church and they're giving the pastor a really good thing for Pastor Appreciation Day. That's a good thing. Uh, you should never be mad if they're giving your pastor something good. You should never uh, feel a bad way about it because look at all he's done. He's labored in the word and doctrine. It says in verse 18, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. You know, you shouldn't put the muzzle on the ox mouth that's treading out the corn. He's working. Let him bend his head down and eat some of the corn. The laborer is worthy of his reward. You know, you shouldn't, uh, you know, if your preacher is ministering to you in s spiritual things, you shouldn't withhold carnal things from him. He's the laborer, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. But I'm going to go ahead and stop there for now and continue later. The main reason is because I'm almost late for work. So let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So Paul says, For the scripture saith, Notice Paul is a scripture quoter. He said, the scripture saith. I can't tell you how many times somebody's called me out and says, said, you're always saying the Bible says. The Bible says this. The Bible says that. Well, Paul did it. Paul says, for the scripture saith. He took... Uh, he, he took the Bible very serious. The, the word was precious to him. You're going to find that most people today, even Christians, the scriptures aren't precious to them at all. They could care less what it says. It's all about how they feel, what they think. It's all about their experience. They could care less what the scripture said. You don't see Paul changing it. He says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and he's quoting Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. He's a scripture quoter. And you look at other verses like, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 14. And here he's talking about the same thing. Where he says, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? He's comparing uh, somebody that gives out the, he's giving out the word of God like a pastor, preacher, teacher, comparing them to a soldier. So a shepherd, a, a pastor is compared to a soldier. And he says, who goeth, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? See, um, the soldier has uh, got a paid way. And then he says, Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? So he's compar comparing a, a pastor to a soldier, to a farmer, and to a shepherd. And then he says in verse 9, or he says in chapter 9 and verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. And then he even gives an Old Testament example of it. For it is written in the law of Moses. Look at him quoting scripture again there. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? See, uh, the ox is a worker. It's a, he's a servant. You shouldn't stop him from bending his head down and eating some of the corn. 
Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now look at this, 1 Corinthians 9.11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying it's, uh, it's not wrong for you to pay your pastor or who, whoever's given you these spiritual things. But he's given you these spiritual things. Is it wrong for him to reap the carnal things? The things that you give him to help him keep his head above water. To help him and his family to survive in this physical world. And the thing about Paul is, he didn't, um, when it came to the Corinthians, he exercised his liberty not to take their money or anything that they gave him. To, to, to stay a good testimony to them and whatnot. But it's certainly not a bad thing for you to pay your pastor. You know, there's people that go around saying that, that uh, a, a pastor needs to get a full-time job and provide for himself and so that they don't have to, to support him and his family. But that's wrong according to the Bible. Back in 1 Timothy 5.18, For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And he said, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Definitely suitable to pay your pastor to be good to him, help him out, and give him carnal things just as much as he's given you spiritual things. Then he says in verse 19, 1 Timothy 5, 19, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So, once again, Paul, the scripture quoter, you see it back in Deuteronomy 19, 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So, Paul quoting some script, scripture there again, and he's, he's saying... You need two or three witnesses there. If you're going to rebuke an elder, you need to have two or three witnesses there so that they can confirm what was said, confirm what happened. And then he says, them that sin, re 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 rebuke before all. So if the accusations turn out to be true, then he needs to be re rebuked before all that others also may fear as a deterrent to crime. So, as a deterrent from it to happen again, you got you get other people in fear of doing it, so because, you know, they're not going to be want to be rebuked before everybody. So, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Don't just go up to him alone to give this accusation. And then he says in verse 21, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So see, the temptation is there for you to let it slide for some people when they do wrong and then to be hard on another person because you don't like them or because they're not as well known or don't have as big of a name and whatnot but he's saying you do these he ch he's charging timothy before god and before the lord jesus christ and the elect angels the an that be the angels of god not the angels that sinned but the elect angels Ob observe these things without preferring one before another doing nothing by partiality and you know the bible says if you have respect of persons you commit sin Treating everybody the same, no matter who it is, no matter if he's a big name, no matter if he's a little name, no matter if he's your relative, no matter if he's been there a long time. And this is easier said than done. Doing it without preferring one before another. Doing nothing by partiality. So Paul charges Timothy, he says, 
And then he's, he's using that two or three witnesses thing too before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. He's charging him. He's charging him before two or three witnesses himself there. And if you take into account an innumerable company of angels, that's a whole lot of witnesses, the elect angels. Then he says in verse 22, lay hands suddenly on no man. And that doesn't mean don't be hitting people, don't be hitting another man. He's talking about like when you ordain somebody, don't put your hands quickly on somebody. They need to first be proved. Like he said back there in 1 Timothy 3.10, when it came to the deacons, he said, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon. So lay hands suddenly on no man. You need to let them prove themselves. Are they faithful? Do they meet the qualifications for the job? And then he says, Neither be thou partaker of other men's sins. So it seems like in the context here, you lay hands suddenly on somebody and you're not sure about them or just too quickly. It's almost like you're, you're help, helping them along to mess some people up but taking it further don't be partaker of other men's sins you know the great verses evil communications corrupt good manners follow not a multitude to do evil just because everybody's doing it don't mean you got to partake in it and he says keep thyself pure keep thyself pure what does he say in first corinthians 15 23 Or 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. He says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You keep yourself pure. Try your best to live right when you mess up. We gotta confess our sins. First John one nine. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's for fellowship, keeping yourself pure. So lay hands suddenly on no man. Neither be thou, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Don't go along with it. Just because you're you prefer somebody before another, don't do it by partiality. And don't be partaker of other men's sins. There's the temptation to go along with bad stuff. Maybe certain preachers are doing that you like just because you like him and because he's a good preacher. That doesn't mean you should go along with those bad things he's doing. Then verse 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So drink no longer, no longer water, but use a little wine. Now this is the biggest, one of the biggest Use verses in the Bible for somebody that loves to drink alcohol. And here's some questions you should ask yourself if you're using that verse to justify it. He said, use a little wine. Is it you're drinking just a little? And then he said, for thy stomach's sake. Another question to ask yourself, are you sick? Are you sick? Is that why you're uh, using the wine? Another thing to ask yourself did the doctors prescribe it? Or are you just diagnosing yourself here? Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Do you have often infirmities? Is that why you're doing it? Another question to ask yourself. Do you know for sure this is even talking about alcoholic wine? There's two kinds of wine in the Bible. Isaiah 65, 8 says, New wine's found in the cluster. Proverbs 3, 10 says, The presses shall burst with new wine. If the presses are bursting with new wine, it couldn't have been fermented. It just came off the presses. It has to be grape juice. You know, you take other things into consideration. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, Abstain from all appearance of evil. The, one of the first answers I give when somebody says, Well, is alcohol a sin? And I say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. You know, I read the Bible. You see me reading the Bible in here every day. What would you think uh, Friday night you go to the bar or something and you see me sitting there drinking alcohol? What are you going to say about me to the people at work 
next week, they're going to say, well, he's a hypocrite. Well, exactly. So that you answered your question. Is it good to drink alcohol? No, it's not. Even if you're not getting drunk, everybody's going to assume you are. Romans 14, 21. What does it say? You go look at it. He talks about your brother stumbling. Romans 14, 21. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. People's looking at you. People's counting on you. You're standing up as a Bible believer, and then you're going to go drink wine, and it's going to cause other people to stumble. It's going to be the appearance of evil, no matter how you look at it. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and thine often infirmities. He says, Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. So, some people's sins, God's not going to deal with them about it until the judgment. It seems like they're getting away with it, but nobody is getting away with anything. Nobody's getting away with nothing. Uh, you think you you think you got secret sins? No sins are hidden. Some men's sins are open beforehand. You know, some people they pay for their sin right now while they're here. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. But and some men they follow after. Some people ain't gonna face their sins until they, until they get uh, a lost person, get to the great white throne judgment, and face them there. The God's gonna open the books, and they're gonna. It, God's gonna decide just how bad the lake of fire is gonna be for them. You know, some Christians who maybe they did good works, but were they doing those good works for themselves, or maybe they didn't have good works at all? When they get to the judgment seat of Christ, all those works or lack thereof, it's going to be burned up, and they're not going to get any any rewards. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. Some Christians, they just reap it here in the flesh. It seems like they can't catch a break. Some are going to get up to the judgment seat of Christ, and they're going to have nothing. But then, in verse 25, he says, Likewise also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. You see, uh, it may seem like you've, you've tried to live for the Lord all your life, and all the stuff you've done, you've done it for the Lord, and you've tried to live right, and it seems like you just can't catch a break, and nobody maybe even knows about the good things you do for the Lord. But one day... It's going to come out in the open. It's not going to be able to be hidden. Just like the sins don't go unnoticed. God sees them all. The good things you do don't go unnoticed. God sees them all. And your, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your good works are going to catch up with you just like your bad works are going to catch up with you. Just like in Galatians 6... Where he says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So you sow good things, you're going to reap good things. You sow bad things, you're going to reap bad things. But some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. So that is the end of 1 Timothy chapter 5.